It's Tuesday the 7th of May and it's time for a big aviation update. My name's Juan Brown, you're watching the Blanco Lirio channel and we're going to be talking about some aviation subjects that are in the news today from a commercial pilot's perspective. We're going to cover the Russian Sukhoi crash uh, near Moscow. We're going to talk briefly about the Miami 737 correction, the Miami Air International 737 runway overrun in Jacksonville, NAS Jacksonville. And then we'll do a 737 MAX update following the 60 Minutes Australia episode which aired recently. Now these videos are a series of videos on the 737 MAX in particular. So far we have a series of over 10 videos. So each, even though I try to make each video a standalone video, each video builds on itself as we work through each bit of subject material. So the best way to keep current and qualified on what's going on here on the on the uh, Blanco Lirio channel is hit like and subscribe but when you hit subscribe you will not get the notifications unless you hit the little bell next to the subscribe button and set up the notifications to the way you want them set up. First up the Aeroflot crash near Moscow. On Sunday the 5th of May a uh, Sukhoi Superjet SSJ-100 aircraft departed the airport near Moscow, whose name I'm not going to try and mispronounce, <laughs> and uh, flew for about 28 minutes, claimed he had a lightning strike, had some equipment failure or, and or radio failure, returned to the airport and promptly crash landed. It's very hard to get information out, proper information out of uh, Russia. And it's even harder when our own uh, Tom Costello from NBC News is going on, on, on and on about fuel dumping on an aircraft that doesn't even have fuel dumping capability. The SSJ-100 Sukhoi jet is a smaller regional jet. These aircraft do not have, do not need fuel dumping capability. This also is an aircraft that is not certified for flight here in the United States. It's also an aircraft that has a kind of a sketchy maintenance history. Fuel dumping is only needed in very large aircraft in conditions which the landing distance is in question. If you need to immediately return to an airport and have so much fuel on board that your weight is such that you may not be able to land and get the aircraft stopped in the amount of runway available, that's when you may want to consider dumping fuel. As aircraft designs continue to improve and engine performance continues to improve, the whole concept of fuel dumping is becoming less and less popular or less and less needed. So what happened to the Sukhoi? It appears to me watching the, the video that the pilot simply botched the landing. Now there may be some extenuating circumstances as to why the aircraft might, may have been a little bit hard to control, but if you watch the video you'll see the aircraft coming in for a landing. It's going to be a heavyweight landing with all that fuel, something you should be practicing with regularity and the aircraft bounces. He bounces hard off of the runway, skips back up into the air he bounces so hard and then he makes a fatal rookie pilot maneuver of pushing the nose of the aircraft back down on the runway hard and that's what caused the fuel tanks to erupt and the fireball to commence. So what about a lightning strike? Lightning strikes are very common in airliners as they're flying, we're flying through that kind of weather all the time and the aircraft is well designed to handle lightning strikes. That's why we have static wicks and a robust electrical system to handle lightning strikes. Now, we don't know much about the Sukhoi uh, Superjet design. I suspect it's a bit of a copy of an Airbus design, which means that it's going to be a fly-by-wire type design. In a fly-by-wire type design, Airbus, I got a couple years on the Airbus A320, now this is Airbus talk, not necessarily Sukhoi, but if it is a copy of the Airbus, you've got three laws of flight control in an Airbus aircraft, normal, alternate, and direct. Normal law offers considerable protections against stalling the aircraft or getting the aircraft out of control and is specifically designed for low-time pilots to handle large aircraft. When you work your way all the way down to direct law, you are at a state where the pilot's input has a direct 
input to the flight controls. In normal law, flight, the uh, pilot's flight controls only has a partial input and the flight computers do the rest of the input into the flight controls offering the protections. So there's some debate as to whether perhaps this lightning strike on this Sukhoi aircraft brought this, the flight control computer system down to a level of direct law, forcing the pilots to fly the aircraft manually without assistance of the flight control computers. That will have to be determined by investigators and it's going to be a real challenge coming out of Russia. Okay, next up on Friday, 3 May, Miami Air International overran the runway at NAS Jacksonville. NTSB is investigating this. We'll have a very clear understanding of what happened here. This is going to be a story of human factors. And it's also going to be a case where, as a pilot, I'd rather use my good judgment rather than my good flying skills to get me out of a precarious situation. Some of the facts that the NTSB has released so far is that the 737 touched down at 178 knots of ground speed. That's 163 knots of indicated airspeed. That means they were landing with about a 15 knot tailwind, which is right at the limit for the 737. They also landed with flaps 30 instead of flaps 40. But that's not outside of the norm. And they had to land over a barrier at the Naval Air Station, more on that in a minute, which effectively reduced their runway length. The runway at NAS uh, Jacksonville is about 9,000 feet long. There is a barrier 1,200 feet down the runway, so that gave the crew of Miami Air International a effective runway length of 7,800 feet. There was weather in the area, heavy rain, the runway was wet. Also, the left thrust reverser was pinned in the in-op position, and this is a normal condition. You can fly with one of your thrust reversers locked out as long as it's noted in the MEL, the minimum equipment list, and you comply with the procedures in the MEL. And one of the things in the 737 MEL that states if you are to fly with a pinned thrust reverser, you need to be landing in conditions of breaking action three or better. In other words, breaking action three means a wet runway or medium breaking action, which may very well be the case here at Jacksonville. It looks like they had breaking action three. What we don't know so far is what were the auto brakes set to, may or may not be a factor, and how far down the runway did they actually touch down. One of the nerdy things you remember from uh, pilot training is the old uh, formula, nine times the square root of the tire pressure, or technically 8.7 times the square root of the tire pressure. That's your hydroplaning speed for rubber tires. Of course, there's different variations on hydroplaning, viscous hydroplaning, water hydroplaning, steam hydroplaning. Here's the proper different forms of hydroplaning. But regardless, at nine times the square root of the tire pressure of about 190 pounds for a 737 main tire, they were well above hydroplaning speed, meaning they were susceptible to hydroplaning. So what investigators are looking at is why did the crew decide to land with the tailwind when the runway was already set up to land into the wind with the barrier on the approach end of the west runway already in the down position, giving him full length of the runway? Well, according to ATC tapes, the crew and ATC was having a discussion about the weather and they wanted to work their way around some rough weather and the best way around the rough weather was to set them up for a runway to the east, the runway with the tailwind and the runway with the barrier in the up position. These barriers can be moved but it takes a long time. This was also getting, well it was Friday, it was getting close to be the weekend so it's going to take even longer to get those barriers, barriers removed or laid down and the runway changed around. About these barriers, these barriers are a arresting cable designed to catch your Navy fighter type aircraft that are having a brake problem and are threatening to go off the end of the runway. So they put a cable, a good sized cable that they can hook up with their, hook onto with their tail hook. And these 
cables are held off of the runway a couple of inches by big donuts, big rubber donuts. Now you can taxi a commercial aircraft, we used to do this all the time in a 141, you can com taxi a commercial aircraft slowly over these barriers and you'll feel them, ba -dum, ba -dum. but you don't want to hit those barriers at high speed because the barrier, the cable will bounce off of the runway and damage the bottom of the aircraft. That's why if you have a barrier up, you need to land beyond that barrier, effectively displacing the threshold and reducing the available runway available. And the final human factor to consider in this particular incident will be scheduling and pilot experience. But scheduling, how fatigued, how tired were these guys at the end of this day? Was this the end of a long day of flying for them? And I got to tell you, as a pilot, at the end of a long day, all you want to do is get this thing on the ground and get to the hotel and get some rest. And that will start to cloud your judgment. And you may not see all these cards stacking up against you and just make the decision to land with the tailwind instead of just saying, hey, wait a minute, let's stop this whole operation. Let's work our way around this weather and get this thing pointed into the wind and land into the wind and give ourselves the most options available instead of setting ourselves up for a situation which stacks all the odds against us. Here's the location of the barrier the crew needed to land over on the DOD Department of Defense plates for NAS Jacksonville, Naval Air Station, Jacksonville. And the aircraft came to a stop off the end of the runway at Piney Point in the St. Johns River. Finally, a 737 MAX update. Following the 60 Minutes Australia program, that program is continuing the myth that the 737 by and of itself is an inherently unstable aircraft. What they're missing the point and what a lot of the comments on these videos, on this video series I'm putting together seems to indicate is that why folks don't understand why we have MCAS in the 737 MAX in the first place. The 60 Minutes Australia show had some great interviews and one of the things we're learning is that of course the 737 MAX is in response to the direct competition from Airbus and their A320 program, specifically the A320neo. The A320neo aircraft is an aircraft that pilots are able to fly with the same Airbus A320 type rating. So and this competition got in a big rush when American Airlines announced it wanted to buy a whole bunch of Airbus aircraft and Boeing decided they could sell Air American Airlines 730, a new version of the 737. But in order to compete with Airbus, the new 737 MAX had to have a single type certificate that allowed pilots to fly the new 737 MAX aircraft along with all the previous iterations of the 737 without additional training just like the 320neo has the same type certificate as all the previous versions of the A320. Why do they need a single type rating? To save time, money, cost, and pilot training. As an airline pilot, I'm only qualified to fly one type of aircraft at a time, and so once I'm checked out and qualified in a 737, I can fly any of the 737 type aircraft in the entire fleet. Now when they mounted the newer bigger engines on the 737 MAX in slow speed flight when you power up it's going to produce a pitch up tendency. This is normal. Uh, pilots coming from aircraft like the 757 and 767 are very used to this pitch up tendency with large powerful engines mounted underneath the wing. It's just the fact that this 737 is now pitching up a little bit more than the previous iterations of the 737s with much smaller engines that in order to maintain the same type certificate rating something had to be done about that pitch up to make it feel like the rest of the 737 and thus MCAS was developed. MCAS is not a stall prevention system. The highly trained pilots are your primary stall prevention system. At least with Boeing aircraft, the story is completely different for Airbus. The 737 MAX is not inherently unstable. 
True, MCAS in its first iteration can drive the aircraft. It could drive the aircraft right into the ground. It could drive it right out of the envelope, right into an area of instability. But the aircraft itself, when operated within the envelope, is a stable aircraft. So why don't we just get rid of MCAS and operate the 737 under a separate type certificate? How many Boeing 737s would Boeing be able to sell that would require a separate type certificate rating from all the other Boeing 737s? You might as well go back to the drawing board and start from scratch. And starting from scratch would, would have required over $30 billion in startup costs and most importantly it would have taken too much time to catch up with the competition Airbus. So for more information on all this, stay tuned, hit like and subscribe, hit that notification bell if you want to keep up with the latest updates. See you here.